So it's great honor for me to lead and to facilitate this particular panel and the topic most fascinates me. It's about uh, the anti-discrimination mechanism, how this mechanism is working in Hungary and in Moldova. And uh, we have uh, three speakers. Uh, two of them is working in such an anti-discrimination institution, equality institution, and the one is an attorney uh, who brings the cases, I guess who brings the cases to this um, anti-discrimination mechanism. And my, uh, uh, I urge you, I urge the uh, speakers to talk about the particular cases on discrimination of ethnic and religious minorities, uh, for um, I, I prefer to hear such landmark cases and how would you encourage uh, religious and ethnic minorities to litigate and to use this mechanism. Uh, it's time for our for my colleague. Uh, sorry, his name is Marton Udvari attorney of uh, a legal defense bureau for national and ethnic minority uh, based in Hungary and he will speak about the minority issues and this anti-discrimination mechanism that exists in Hungary. Now floor is yours and you can take it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me also welcome you and uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for your interest in this topic and uh, just uh, in this uh, qu quite short period uh, I will uh, talk about basically four issues. I will introduce uh, my organization uh, very briefly. Uh, I will speak about the types of cases we are dealing with uh, and a little bit about our methods and then I'd like to speak about the uh, difficulties uh, uh, victims of discrimination face when bringing their cases uh, to to uh, to legal uh, fora, and also I will uh, talk about uh, the impact of of the implementation of of uh, EU rules, the EU directives, because I think uh, this uh, this was a very uh, drastic change uh, 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 in legal sense, uh, but also in the li in the everyday uh, life of, of uh, NGOs. So uh, the organization is called Legal Defense Bureau for National and Ethnic Minorities, uh, which suggests that we are uh, dealing with all uh, kinds of minorities, uh, but in practice, 99. 0.9% of our cases concern uh, Roma and discrimination of Roma. Uh, we are fundamentally a, a legal organization, so we are trying to combat discrimination with legal means. Uh, this means that we are maintaining a, uh, a legal aid service uh, in the framework of which we are receiving uh, complaints from all over uh, the country. And uh, we are giving information, uh, uh, we are trying to help with smaller uh, 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 services like, uh, like uh, compiling a, uh, a document to, for example, a local uh, government. Uh, so this is one of our legal activities. The other one is uh, strategic litigation. So we try to find uh, cases that could have a broader effect. Uh, on the legal, on the Hungarian legal system, on the Hungarian legal practice, uh, or we try to take cases uh, which concern a greater number of people. Uh, and these two kinds of uh, activities uh, very closely connected. Uh, so uh, we receive a lot of comp complaints. Uh, in the framework of the uh, uh, legal aid uh, service uh, and we try to select some of them 
uh, in which we can initiate a, a strategic uh, a litigation. Uh, besides the legal activities, we are uh, trying to uh, use other means to combat discrimination. So we are conducting anti-discrimination trainings, tolerance uh, building trainings. Uh, we are compiling studies. We are trying to synthesize our experiences. Uh, but basically, uh, the the most important part of our work is is uh, is the legal part. I would say. Right now, we have uh, four or three strategic areas. Uh, these are combating hate crimes. Uh, hate crimes uh, meaning that uh, uh, some kind of violence uh, against. Roma people because of uh, his or her ethnic origin. A very typical uh, kind of perpetrator in Hungary is, is uh, members of, of extremist organizations. Uh, they, there are quite many, or there are a couple of uh, very strong such, uh, I would say, militant or, or, or hostile uh, uh, groups, uh, but also we are dealing with a lot of, I would say, everyday violence. So uh, violence committed by uh, everyday people. Uh, so not members of, of these kinds of, uh, of uh, extremist movements. And unfortunately, there are uh, a lot of instances of this uh, everyday violence when seemingly uh, ordinary people uh, commit uh, violence against uh, a Roma people, a Roma person. Uh, so we are trying to, in, in this aspect, uh, our legal framework is uh, quite all right, I would say. The problem is with the implementation of the rules, uh, with the, especially with the investigations. So in, in a lot of uh, cases, police try to ignore the uh, uh, hate motive, so the, the discrimination motive behind these violence, uh, violent attacks. Uh, so we try to change that, and we take, uh, and that's why we are taking cases to to the police and then to to the courts. Uh, another uh, strategic area of ours is uh, combating hate speech. It's also uh, quite widespread in Hungary uh, to express. Uh, uh, hostile views uh, uh, towards Roma or in connection uh, uh, with Roma. Uh, and there are not so many legal uh, ways to, to challenge these kinds of uh, uh, expressions, but we try to use those that are available. We have some new uh, developments in the, in the legal system, so we try to build a good case law around this new legislation. Uh, and we are focusing on, on hate speech uh, by public figures, meaning members of parliament, mayors, uh, other kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of public uh, persons. Uh, and also hate speech uh, that are communicated in the media, because obviously the media has a lot of has, has, a, has a very a big effect, uh, and we try to challenge uh, hate speech uh, uh, communicated by the media, especially. Our third strategic area is, uh, is discrimination in, in, in accessing to social services. So, as you might know, the, the Hungarian Roma live under uh, very poor uh, conditions. Uh, the un unemployment rate is, is very high. The level of education is, is, uh, is, is very low. It means that a lot of Roma people have to depend on so, uh, social service, services, social benefits, uh, and uh, they are present in the uh, public work system. We have a and, and we are focusing on this public work system, uh, especially in, in this area. So we have a new uh, system in which if you are unemployed, uh, then you basically have to accept the work that uh, the state offers to you. 
but the system is such that it gives a space to discrimination. Uh, also, some uh, some rules of this uh, or some elements of this uh, uh, pu pu uh, public work system is, is discriminatory. Uh, so there are a lot of problems in this regard. So we are trying to uh, deal uh, with these questions as well, and also we are focusing on distribution of, of social services because sometimes, uh, in practice, uh, uh, Roma treated different are treated differently than than non-Roma uh, in this area as well. And we have a fourth uh, area, uh, which is uh, which is basically. Just the continuation of our previous work is uh, is uh, so we are trying to to use our experience in in anti-discrimination uh, litigation uh, in more traditional uh, cases like discrimination in employment or discrimination in in accessing social services or uh, public services like going to a pub or going to a, a, a restaurant uh, and. Uh, uh, so we are take, taking these kinds of uh, cases. So now, about the difficulties uh, of, of victims uh, to 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 speak up or speak or step up again uh, uh, in yeah against against the uh, various violence or violations uh, of of their rights. Uh, so there are uh, uh, many. Uh, uh, such difficulties, and I think uh, these kinds of difficulties are present in your countries as well. So I will uh, just uh, shortly mention these difficulties, and we'll focus on the impact of of the uh, EU directives. But basically, uh, w uh, the diffi one of the difficulties is is uh, is a lack of trust. Or uh, from the uh, from from the Roma communities or the Roma minority, and this and this lack of trust is at least twofold. So Roma people, I mean, in in general, I would say or I could say that uh, the Hungarian society is quite uh, ha has a low level of trust in uh, public institutions, but it's uh, even more. Uh, applicable to the Roma community, so they are very uh, uh, reserved towards uh, state institutions like police and courts and and other kinds of institutions, uh, and it 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 is definitely a barrier uh, when uh, you are uh, trying to convince a victim of discrimination to to take a case uh, uh, to to an in front of an institution. But also, Roma are quite uh, reluctant towards NGOs as well. So sometimes it's uh, not easy to convince them that you are there to help, uh, that they can trust you, trust your your organization. So this uh, issue of, of trust is uh, definitely a, a big one. Also, uh, there is a quite high level of passivity. Um, in in the Roma community, so they tend to be uh, very passive in other uh, uh, spheres of of public life, like uh, voting or organizing demonstrations or or, or uh, these kinds of uh, activities. Uh, and it's closely related to their uh, living conditions that are very harsh. Uh, so this passivity is also a barrier. Uh, also, in a lot of cases, another barrier or difficulty is uh, fear of uh, fear from retaliation, uh, e uh, especially in in a, in a local level or in in smaller settlements where uh, there are a couple of very strong power holders, like like the mayor, uh, the chief of police, and uh, and they are quite afraid of taking legal steps which involve challenging these uh, uh, the activities of these uh, power holders so uh, this this uh, fear of retaliation is is a strong barrier as well uh, and also uh, taking a case to a 
court is a complicated matter, it's a complicated procedure with a lot of uh, uh, complicated rules. Uh, so they definitely need uh, someone to help. And then we come to the uh, further barrier is the lack of professional help. So the legal aid capacities, legal aid organizations uh, drastically uh, decreased in Hungary. So there are, especially in the countryside, so uh, most of the legal aid organizations like ours are based in Budapest. Uh, and it's uh, it's very time consuming, energy cons consuming, money consuming to to offer your help uh, in the countryside uh, because it's physically far uh, from from Budapest, uh, and there are a lot of other local uh, uh, conditions that you uh, you have to know and you have to overcome. So basically, these are the main barriers uh, of of uh, of uh, of convincing or, or or of a victim to take a, a legal uh, step uh, in challenging a discriminatory practice, uh, and just very briefly, let me talk about the impact of uh, the EU directives, uh, because uh, when these directives were introduced or and and we started to implement it. And uh, the Hungarian rules were uh, were uh, uh, being composed. Uh, it was quite obvious that it's a very uh, uh, drastic change uh, from a even from a legal point of view, or especially from a legal point of view, because uh, the directives introduced a lot of uh, new uh, 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 new rules like uh, the, the shifting or the splitting of the burden of proof or the right of NGOs to represent a, a victim of discrimination. This one is also uh, very important because before that you had to, uh, you had to have a lawyer, an attorney to, to bring your case, but uh, after that uh, you could uh, uh, use a NGO uh, to represent you, uh, and it was uh, it was a big thing for the NGOs as well because it made litigation uh, and legal proce procedures uh, much more cheaper for NGOs as well because they could uh, do the litigation themselves or with their uh, own uh, colleagues. Uh, so it was uh, a very uh, big thing. Uh, and also the possibility of, of, of the so-called public interest claims, uh, which means that uh, NGOs in some cases can uh, litigate cases on their own, so they don't have to have a actual victim, uh, but they could, I meaning the NGO could initiate the legal proceeding on, on their own initiative. Uh, and it also made uh, litigation easier because, uh, as I said, uh, sometimes there are very strong barriers from victims like fear of reta retaliation uh, to be involved in, in a legal case. So uh, in this way, uh, giving an, an NGO to, to, to a right to initiate a legal procedure uh, really proved to be really uh, helpful uh, because uh, we don't have we don't have to deal with these kind of considerations uh, of, of the victims. Uh, so, yeah, basically these were, were the points I wanted to highlight and I hope we will have time to discuss them uh, in, in a more deeper way uh, during the question and answer session. So, thank you and looking forward to your questions and or comments. I think this is the moment when we can go back to your question that uh, how the ideal equality body would look like, but this is uh, not what the fully competent equality body would look like, but this is not what I wanted to ask. I leave this question to you. What I wanted to add that um, I read a study done by ERIO, it's a Roma information raised the Roma Information Organization, and they made a study of the use of uh, the equality bodies in Europe by Roma 
communities and they find fine, uh, five main obstacles of uh, Roma using the equality bodies and I would like to short list it uh, quickly and I would like to know your opinion. First they said it's under reporting, this is the main obstacle or challenge and the lack of informal hearings and exchange with Roma communities and too much procedure and uh, not having various levels of response and procedures for different uh, people or different diverse communities. The second is the lack of awareness of rights. There is a lot of exp um, data and example that, for example, 25% of the respondents were aware of the existence of the anti-discrimination law as such. And there are millions of examples of people being asked that, do you think uh, there is discrimination, saying that no, 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 but of course we don't want Roma as an employee of the company. So not being even uh, aware of the fact what is uh, discrimination. The third is lack of trust. So they, they were said that uh, basically they don't trust the state authorities and institutions as such. So the question how the equality body can address this uh, this lack of trust, and then funding, funding of the equality bodies, resources, and the lack of equality data. Thank you. So fr from an NGO uh, point of view, I think uh, the ideal equality body, I mean, certainly it has to have a lot of uh, uh, characteristics, but just to name a few is that it, I think it should be competent, meaning that uh, knowing uh, the the rules uh, of of uh, non-discrimination law, which is uh, not uh, easy, because I think it's a quite complicated area, uh, and it was a bigger problem uh, around I don't know like five eight years ago when uh, when the rules were introduced. And uh, it was a very new area, uh, so the judges and, and other uh, 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 legal practitioners have to learn uh, this new area and have to uh, 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 develop a good uh, case law. So competence in this regard is, uh, I think, is, is very important. Uh, the other one is independence, so it should be independent from, from the state because in many times it examines the actions uh, uh, of the state. Uh, also it should be client friendly, I would say, uh, which means that uh, uh, it should appreciate that uh, uh, the special needs of, of, of victims of discrimination, uh, I mean in general I would say that, that the whole legal system should be more uh, client friendly including the courts and court procedures but uh, in this area uh, it's it's a very uh, uh, strong need uh, to be uh, client friendly and uh, have uh, uh, rules that are not uh, so strict or or or, or give way to to help uh, the victim in in the procedure uh, and also the ideal equality body should be well funded because uh, the shortage of funding uh, relates to a lot of other uh, areas so even if it's a perfect body with, 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 with excellent uh, uh, people, excellent officials, if they don't have the money to, to, to investigate uh, uh, cases uh, then it will have a lesser effect, and also the bud with the budget, uh, the the government can uh, influence uh, the equality body as well. So uh, you don't, so you can influence a, a equality body in 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 many ways, and one of them is, for example, to cut the budget or to to manipulate the budget. So it's a uh, it's a very uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, connection. Uh, and you mentioned a lot of obstacles, and uh, I also talked about a lot of obstacles. Uh, what I'd like to add is that when we are 
uh, speaking with a client, with a victim of discrimination, they basically always tell what are the choices, what ways uh, he or she can go. So she can go to he or she can go to a court, to an equality body, to the ombudsman, or uh, there basically these are the, the choices. And uh, and the equality body uh, uh, from these choices, I think is is. is Maybe it's the is, is the best choice or or the better choice uh, because of of uh, uh, in Hungary the equality bodies yeah yeah they have stick tools but they they are quite client friendly so they are not as uh, as uh, distant as a court uh, the procedure is is much uh, quicker uh, it's less complicated it's uh, less expensive so there are a lot of uh, uh, these uh, characteristics that that uh, make uh, the victims usually prefer uh, the equality body or or the ombudsman.